So uh, our next award is, is new for the section, as I mentioned. Uh, it is the uh, Ronald Greeley Early Career Award in Planetary Science, the inaugural uh, awarding of this, of this new prize in our section. It's very personal for me, uh, someone who knew Ron uh, for a long time. As most of you know, uh, Ron, who's shown here, I, I had to use a picture of him in the field with students because I think that's where he was happiest. Uh, most of you know Ron passed away unexpectedly in October of 2011 when he was still a highly active member of our community. He was a figure of great influence and import in our field and to me personally I have spent essentially my whole career with Ron as a mentor. He gave me my first job in, acad in academic research when I was 20 years old. And uh, I've spent really uh, my whole career with him as a mentor and I know many of you have as well. So we're really pleased to be able to honor his legacy of working closely with young scientists through the establishment of this award. Uh, I wouldn't normally do this, but if you'll indulge me, since it's the first time we've given the award, I'd like to spend a few minutes reflecting on Ron's contribution and his life. Uh, Ron was a planetary geologist and regents professor at Arizona State University. He was involved in lunar and planetary missions dating back to 1967 when he worked at NASA Ames Research Center in preparation for the Apollo missions to the moon. He joined the faculty at ASU in 1977 with a joint professorship in the Department of Geology and the Center for Meteorite Studies. His research in planetary geology has contributed significantly to our understanding of planets and moons within the solar system. He was, in fact, a pioneer in the field with contributions to essentially all aspects of planetary geologic processes on nearly every solid body explored by spacecraft in our solar system. He was involved in nearly every major uh, space mission flown in the solar system since Apollo, uh, including the Galileo mission to Jupiter, the Viking landers to Mars, Mars Pathfinder, Mars Global Surveyor, the Mars Exploration Rovers, and the European Mars Express mission, to name only a few. Ron's service to our field was unparalleled. He served on and chaired uh, many, many, many NASA and National Academy of Science panels, include, including Complex, he was the inaugural chair of MEPAG, uh, and many, many more. Uh, he chaired more science definition teams for missions than I can recount. And uh, in this way, I think his legacy is really, in part, a very strong influence, stronger than most, than almost anyone else we can probably think of, you know, counting on one hand, I would say. Um, a very strong influence on, on the missions that we are, in fact, today flying and executing and, and will be long into the future due to uh, his leadership and influence along with many others. He really did, and those of you that served on committees with him or observed him leading committees uh, will, will attest to the fact that he had a knack for getting to pe people to work together towards consensus solutions to our community's diverse problems. I remember in one of the early MEPAG meetings, he had a slide of opening a can of worms about the future of Mars and, and then showed all the worms swimming in the same direction. <laughs> and that was the challenge he took on, and he really did succeed in bringing the community together in that way. Watching him run a meeting like this was always very inspirational to me. Now, as I said, he was probably happiest in his professional life when he was teaching students in the field, so that's why I chose this picture to show you today. Uh, he greatly enjoyed leading geologic field trips, uh, particularly in the areas of, of windblown sand and volcanoes. His holy tour uh, field trip, which, raise your hand if you've been on it. Yeah, lots and lots of folks throughout the whole room. Uh, legendary, <laughs> highly influential on a lot of us who, who were in the field with Ron. Uh, he left one, many wonderful legacies in our discipline, but none more than the students and postdocs that he worked with. Uh, many of his students have become leaders themselves in the field of planetary geology. I would say he was a tough but thoughtful mentor. Uh, he always expected excellence and cared deeply about those he worked with. And here, I, again, I speak from experience. He was a, a wonderful mentor for me from the age of 20 until only about 10 days before he died when we last spoke by phone him mentoring me the whole way. <laughs> so I would just like to uh, read a quote from Paul Spudis, one of uh, Ron's well-known former students, who wrote a nice uh, tribute to Ron after his passing. And it gives a sense of the critical role he played in the lives of those who worked closely with him. So I quote Paul. Ron was a great mentor and role model for a modern working scientist. Even as his academic group grew to where he needed to assign work and follow up with later discussion, I was always welcomed into his office to discuss science or other concerns. 
One of Ron's best qualities as an academic mentor was assuming the role of what most graduate students desperately need, yet few ever get, a merciless and persistent editor. I would turn in drafts of papers only to have them handed back to me almost literally in shreds. <laughs> now come on, those of you out who, again, raise your hand, yes. <laughs> you know what we're talking about. <laughs> Working with Ron all those years convinced me of an uncomfortable truth. There's only one way to learn how to write, and then that is to write often and be edited heavily. Of course, I didn't see it that way at the time. Getting a copy of your work covered in red ink is annoying as hell. But an edit from Ron always improved the text, regardless of what it did to my blood pressure. So that from Paul Spudis. <laughs> you know, he's such a calm guy anyway. <laughs> So and finally, uh, nothing was more important to Ron than his family. I'm very pleased that Ron's wife of 51 years, Cindy Greeley, is here with us in the audience. Cindy, will you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> Wonderful. And again, I'm so thrilled that Cindy could be here to witness the first awarding of the Ronald Greeley Early Career, Career Award in Planetary Science. We hope it is a lasting and fitting tribute to Ron's contributions to mentoring in our field. The award will be given each year to an outstanding scientist within six years of receiving their PhD. And I'm honored to present the first award to Dr. Alex Hayes, who will begin a new position as an assistant professor of astronomy at Cornell University next month. There's Alex. Uh, <laughs> yes, we'll say a few more words about him. So Alex's record, Alex's record is incredibly impressive. He's very well suited to be the first Greeley Award winner. He has a mix of science and engineering experience and training, leading to special insight into how to best optimize use of spacecraft data to make scientific breakthroughs. He was among a group of highly qualified nominees for the first Greeley Award, let me tell you. His accomplishments, though, st clearly stood out. He's already co-authored over 40 papers, <laughs> wow. Alex uses spacecraft-based remote sensing to study the properties of planetary surfaces, their interactions with the interior and atmospheres of planets, with a recent focus on Titan and Mars. Titan is the only planetary object besides Earth that supports standing bodies of liquid on its surface, and Alex uses the Cassini radar to study and model surface morphologies on icy satellites, including the distribution and evolution of Titan's hydrocarbon lakes and seas. His first paper became a common reference for Titan's northern lake distribution because Alex carefully and systematically mapped their distribution and classified them into types that have now become standard. He's also interested in studying the depositional and diagenetic history of early Mars, leveraging data from the Mars Exploration Rovers and MRO. But in fact, the words I can best use to describe Alex come from his nominators, and here's just a taste of what they had to say. Alex is unquestionably one of the most exciting new planetary science PhDs in the world. He's particularly prominent in mission-related science, as was Ron Greeley, notably the lakes and morphology of Titan. From personal experience, I can say that Alex is unusually interactive, insightful, and engaged on just about any issue having to do with planetary geology, especially morphology. Another, uh, he has unquenchable curiosity, performs to the highest standards one can expect, and will unquestionably emerge as one of the most influential planetary scientists of his generation. While his natural abilities are all very strong, perhaps his most notable attribute is his tenacious drive to learn. Uh, another, I believe Alex has the promise to be a real leader in the field of planetary science in the coming decades with the ability to blend theory, observations, and flight hardware development in a way that very few people can. Finally, I should mention that he's an individual of truly exemplary character. He is one of the most honest and hardworking people I have ever known, student or otherwise. And finally, a few words from Odette Aronson, his thesis advisor. In addition to Alex's accomplishments, I think he's a particularly appropriate candidate for the first Greeley Award because of some surprising similarities between them. While a direct comparison is, of course, absurd, I note some analogies. Like Ron, Alex started out working on Mars. Later, Ron considered wind speeds necessary to lift grains on Mars. Alex considered winds necessary to raise waves on Titan. Both studied dunes. Both used radar to probe planetary surfaces. Both wrote about icy satellites. Comparing their early careers, they were both astonishingly productive. So this carries with it, Alex, some big responsibility, being the first Greeley Award winner, but we know that you are up to the task. Please join me in congratulating the winner of the first Ronald Greeley Early Career Award in Planetary Science, Dr. Alex Hayes.
it back to you. And we'll well, all I can say is, wow. I am deeply honored to be the inaugural recipient of the Ronald Greeley Early Career Award. Ron was an icon in the field of planetary science, and I think the establishment of this award is a fitting tribute uh, to pay to his career and his memory. Um, we had some time before this session to spend and get to know Cynthia Greeley, who I'd like to thank again for being here today. And I was very interested to learn that the source of Ron's editorial prowess, which Many of the people in the audience, uh, as Laurie has mentioned, have come to know, is in fact Cindy. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I would also like to thank Laurie Leshen and Bill McKinnon and the rest of the planetary science section officers at AGU, as well as the selection committee for organizing this award. And as Laurie mentioned, Ron was not only remembered for his fundamental scientific achievements, but also the time and effort he put into mentoring and supporting early career scientists. And personally, I can say that I was very struck by the fact that no matter where we were, whether I met Ron at a conference or I bumped into him at a Viennese concert, he stopped what he was doing and took the time to ask how things were going for me. And it is in the spirit of that that I would like to thank my own mentors and colleagues who provided the opportunities that I have been fortunate enough to be able to take advantage of. This includes my undergraduate mentors, Steve Squires and Jim Bell, who continue to support me to this day, as well as the entire MER science team, including Ken Herkenhoff, Phil Christensen, and John Grotzinger. Jim and Steve really opened the door for a collection of really young scientists at the time to get involved with MER and then held that door open for years to come. And I also must give my most heartfelt acknowledgement to the Cassini Radar Science Team and Charles Alachi who have not only built a world-class instrument, but welcomed me into their family and even let me use that instrument from time to time. And then most importantly, I must thank both my advisor and nominator for this award, Odette Harrington, who I count not only as a mentor, but as a friend. And there's many other people I'd like to thank who I don't have time to today, but uh, hopefully you know who you are and thank you. And I'd like to close by just saying that this award is really about these people and about the connections that we share within this community. And thank you. Thanks, Alex. Okay, um, can I ask those that are coming into the room to find seats because the fire marshal is going to come in and make you do it anyway? There are seats up, uh, there are lots of seats scattered around, and, and hopefully that everybody's going to be able to get in the room that wants to come in for our final presentation of the, of the session, which is our Whipple Award presentation and lecture. Uh, the Planetary Sciences Section Whipple Award is the highest honor given by our section at AGU. Uh, the award is named for Fred Whipple, a gifted space scientist who's, of course, most noted for his work on understanding comets. He's shown here on the left. And uh, I'm very pleased that our award winner this year is Dr. Stephen Squires of Cornell University, where he is the Goldwyn Smith Professor of Astronomy. He has been involved at some level with many of the most exciting planetary missions we've flown, including Voyager, Magellan, Cassini, Near. Mars Odyssey, Mars Express, MRO, and of course, most of us know Steve Best as the principal investigator for the science payload on the Mars Exploration Rovers Project with its two Energizer Bunny rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, Steve's work has focused on Mars and the moons of the outer planets, uh, best known for research on the study of water on Mars and a possible ocean on Jupiter's moon Europa. He has served as an aquanaut on two NASA NEMO missions. For those of you that don't know, NEMO stands for NASA's Extreme Environment Mission Operations, where he spent many days underwater in a habitat designed to advance our understanding of the challenges faced by human exploration, human explorers beyond Earth. His commitment, Steve's commitment to our community is, is extensive and very well known. He uh, chaired the most recent uh, National Research Council, National Academy's Planetary Science Decadal Survey, which has been so critical in guiding our, uh, our planning and our priorities going forward. He is currently the chair of the NASA Advisory Council, not just the science part, but the chair of the entire Advisory Council for all of the agency, a very important and influential role. Uh, again, his awards and accolades are too numerous to list, but I'll just give you a few. He is um, also the winner of the AAS, uh, or of the American Astronomical Society's Harold Urey Prize, 
uh, the Space Science Award of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and also of the AAS Carl Sagan Award, um, and the Benjamin Franklin Medal of the Franklin Institute. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. To borrow from his nomination letter, uh, to sum up Steve's, uh, Steve's qualifications for the Whipple Award, uh, his nominator said, Steve excels in all key criteria for, the Whipple, for a Whipple recipient. He has propagated planetary science by testing old paradigms and creating new ones, um, uh, and has been prolific in his publications, and he has engaged the public, and he has guided the next generation of planetary scientists, and he has led the planetary science community. Here to deliver his Whipple Award lecture entitled, Clues to a Hot, Wet, and Violent Ancient Mars, Spirit in the Columbia Hills, and Opportunity at Endeavor Crater. Please join me in congratulating and welcoming Steve Squires, winner of the 2012 Whipple Award. Well, thank you very much, Laurie, and, and everyone here. Um, this award is given very generously, and it's received uh, very gratefully. It's a, it's a strange feeling uh, receiving any individual honor in what we all know is very much a, a team sport. Um, I've had the extraordinary good, function, uh, good, good fortune through my career uh, to be able to work with some extraordinarily talented and extraordinarily generous scientists. Uh, Gene Shoemaker was one, Ron Greeley, another, um, Ray Arvidson, Larry Soderblom, Ray Reynolds at Ames, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, at the top of that list for me is this gentleman here, Joe Viverka. Uh, Joe was my advisor when I was in graduate school. Uh, most of what I know about how to do science, I learned from Joe. And in a, in a lovely coincidence, Joe was last year's recipient of the, of the Whipple Award. Um, and an even better coincidence, Joe's advisor, when he was in grad school, was Fred Whipple. <laughs> so I would like to devote this talk today to my, uh, my academic dad and my academic granddad. Um, I am one member of uh, a science team, uh, an extraordinary group of, in of individuals uh, working on the Mars Exploration Rover Project. Here are their names. Uh, there are their smiling faces. I would be doing both them and you a terrible disservice if I were to in any way give the impression that the science that I'm talking about today is science that I did. This is science that they did, uh, and I'm just very, very proud to have been part of this group. Finally, lest we forget, uh, none of what we do with our missions to the planets would be possible without an extraordinary, passionate, talented, devoted family of engineers uh, at JPL, at Goddard, at APL, at the places that make these missions possible. This is some of uh, the MER engineering team down at the Cape the night that they sent Opportunity out to the launch pad, and, and we owe them and I though, owe them uh, our enduring thanks. So I'm going to be talking today about ancient Mars, early Mars, and I'm going to make it sound like a really dangerous place. Um, it was hot. There were sources of heat inside the planet. There were sources of heat in the form of impacts crashing in from outside the planet. It was wet. There was water beneath the ground. There was water probably geysering out of the ground. There were steam vents. There were fumaroles. Uh, it was a hot and nasty place, and it was a violent place. There were explosions. There were volcanic explosions, and there were impacts, rocks flying around. I'm going to make it sound like it was a really dangerous place, and I guess in some respects it was, unless perhaps you were a microbe, in which it might have been fairly nice, and I'll, I'll return to that topic at the very end. Now, a lot of the focus of Mars science right now deservedly is on sedimentary geology, and there are lots of great sedimentary rocks on Mars. 
I'm going to focus instead on the rocks of the ancient heavily tra cratered terrain of Mars. This is a part of a lovely map. It looks very much uh, like those maps that Maria Zuber showed of, uh, of the altimetry of the moon. And in fact, this is a, a map that Maria was very much involved in creating, uh, showing altimetry on Mars. And it makes a crucial point, and that is that most of Mars is actually this ancient heavily created terrain. This is the stuff that Phil, Phil Christensen likes to call blue-collar Mars. Okay? Most of the planet is like this. And so if we want to understand the planet, we must understand this ancient heavily created terrain. The other point is this is the oldest stuff. And as we'll see as we look into the distant past of Mars, this is when we get to the epoch where we had the, the highest temperatures, the most water, the conditions that might have actually been most suitable uh, for the origin and early evolution of life. So I'll be talking today about what we've been able to learn from the Mars Exploration Rovers about this very earliest epoch of Martian history. Now our rovers were never intended to look at the ancient heavily cratered terrain of Mars. They were both targeted to what we hoped and expected would be problems of Martian sedimentology. Uh, the Opportunity Landing Site was chosen because it had flat-lying rocks that we hoped were sedimentary and that it contained the mineral signature of hematite, an iron oxide that speaks of the past existence of liquid water. We got to the surface and we found a sedimentary geology problem of epic proportions uh, with layered uh, sulfate-rich rocks shot through with little hematite-rich concretions that we call blueberries. Uh, we drove around, we found craters, we found stacks of these layered sedimentary rocks that were tens of meters in thickness, did, did uh, stratigraphic sections, really had a great time for five or six years doing nothing but sedimentary geology on Mars. But after five or six years, we began to grow weary of sulfate-rich sandstone. <laughs> and so. Um, with our remarkable engineering team at the, at the helm driving this rover, we embarked on a three-year-long trek to the rim of Endeavour Crater. And Endeavour, which you can see at the upper right here, is an extraordinary crater. It's 22 kilometers in diameter. Uh, here is the view that we first saw as we pulled up to its rim. And what is great about Endeavour is that it is not formed in these sediments uh, that we had been exploring for so many years. In fact, the sediments post-date the crater. The crater was formed in ancient Noachian terrain that lies beneath and then was partially buried, almost completely buried, in fact, by these sediments. But here you have segments of the crater rim rising out of a sea of sulfate-rich sandstone, like islands in a sea of this stuff, and providing us, once we climb up onto it, uh, into a, a, a glimpse of earlier Mars. Uh, we have been exploring the Rim of Endeavour for more than an Earth year now. Uh, this is part of a panorama taken at a place called Greeley Haven, honoring Ron Greeley, who is a valued member of our team. Uh, this is part of what we call the Greeley Panorama, and you can see the rocks here of uh, the crater rim and, and off in the distance. We have spent most of our time uh, since arriving in Endeavour on this one segment of the rim that we've named Cape York. Down here at the southern tip is a place we've called Spirit Point, and the spine of this we've named Shoemaker Ridge. Uh, Greeley Haven is up here towards the, towards the northern end. And you can see this map is current as of a few days ago, uh, the path that we've followed as we have explored Cape York. Now, the case that I'm going to make to you here is that we can actually compare the rim of Endeavour Crater very usefully to the rim of other similar craters uh, on Earth, and I'm going to argue that the stratigraphy, the structure that we see here, is remarkably similar uh, to stratigraphy and structure that we see around similar craters on other worlds, including our own. And I'll return to this in a moment. Now, Spirit was also targeted to what we hoped would be a sedimentary landing site. This is Gusev Crater, 160 kilometers in diameter. There's a great big dried up channel that's flowing into it. There has to have been a lake here at some point. And so we went there hoping to find Martian lake sediments. This is the view that we saw when we landed. And I managed to convince myself for about three days that this is what Martian lake bed sediment should look like. Um, it's nice and smooth and flat. But of course, uh, when we looked at the rocks in detail, 
what we found, in fact, was that these were basaltic lavas. I still believe those sediments have got to be down there someplace. Uh, but we never saw them. We, we tried. We went over to Bonneville Crater, which had punched through the basalt into more basalt, it turns out. And, uh, and that was that. So recognizing that our only chance of finding something different uh, was to literally head for the hills. We uh, sprinted rover speed as fast as we could go. And on day 156 of our 90-day mission to Mars, we arrived at the Columbia Hills, named, of course, after the, the Columbia Space Shuttle, and uh, spent most of the mission exploring those very ancient Martian hills that, again, rise out of this sea of basalts but are older and represent very, very ancient deposits on Mars. This is the hill where we spent most of our time. This is Husband Hill. It was named after Rick Husband, who was the commander of the Columbia when it went down. We climbed Husband Hill. You can see it's about the height of the Statue of Liberty, doing Mar Martian mountaineering all the way to the summit and back down the other side. Um, and I'm going to make the case here that what we're seeing is impact ejecta for the most part, but from very distant, far away impacts. We are not seeing the ejecta of Gusev Crater itself because this lies on the floor of Gusev. Instead, what we're seeing is materials from far away that have been draped over Husband Hill. This is from a poster that was presented at this AGU by Shoshana Cole, a graduate student at Cornell. And what it shows is that over much of Husband Hill, the bedding attitudes are conformal with topography. This stuff was actually draped uh, over this hill. And I'm going to try to make the case to you that these are ejecta from very distant impacts that got kind of piled one on top of another in this location. Now let me begin with, uh, with, with Cape York, and we're going to talk about some of the, the, the dominant rocks, the, the major rock type that one sees when you look at Cape York. You can see that we have driven along the full length of Shoemaker Ridge. Greeley Haven is up here. I'm going to talk about two rocks in particular, one down here called Chester Lake, another one up here at the other end called Transvaal, but these rocks are representative of nearly all of the rocks of Cape York and of the rim of endeavor that we have seen so far. This is Chester Lake. You're seeing here an outcrop that's about a meter or so across. And what you see, <clears throat> and this is what you see everywhere along uh, the spine of Shoemaker Ridge, is you see angular clasts up to centimeters in size embedded in a very fine grain matrix. And you can even get a sense that there's sort of a linear structure, a fabric, if you will, to these rocks. And interestingly enough, where we see that, it points towards the center of the crater. Uh, this is Transvaal, again, the same thing. And you know, every rock up and down the length of, uh, of Cape York, with only a few exceptions, looks like this. These angular class embedded in a very, very fine grain matrix. What this stuff looks like texturally is what's called a suavite breccia. Suavite breccias are found around some impact craters on Earth. They form during the very late stages of the impact event. And you can think of it, you can think of suavites as being almost a, a silicate-driven wind. Okay, this is a very fine-grained wind of extremely fine-grained, vapor, largely vaporized material blowing out across the crater with sufficient violence that is able to pick up and entrain these big angular clasts and then deposit them. There is, however, one other type of rock that we see along Shoemaker Ridge. And it was found only so far in one location, down here at the very, very southern end of Cape York. So this is the place that we called Spirit Point. When we first drove up to it, we found this little crater that we named Odyssey. And Odyssey is about 20, 25 meters or so in diameter, so it has punched through those suavites and down into stuff underneath it. And when you look at the ejecta blocks of materials excavated from Odyssey Crater, they look different. And they are sampling what we believe to be a, a somewhat deeper unit. Now, it can't be real far down. It's only a matter of meters below the surface. But this has been our one look at it. And this is a classic lithic breccia. Chunks the size of your fist chunks the size of your head, glued together. You talk about violence in forming a rock, you would not have wanted to be around when this rock here was formed, because these are big chunks of stuff. This is a, a rock that we named Kid Creek. 
Uh, here's another one, very similar, many centimeters in size, angular clasts uh, fused together in this rock. This is one called Tisdale. I'll return to this one later. Uh, this is one that we spent a lot of time looking at. So this is a lithic breccia, and then on top of that, covering most of Cape York, we have what looks like that suavite breccia. Now I'm going to argue that you can understand this by looking at comparably sized craters elsewhere. Here is Endeavour Crater on Mars and the Rees impact structure in southern Germany at the same scale. They're the same size to within a kilometer or two there. The same size crater, 20 to 25 kilometers in diameter. And when you look at the stratigraphy of the Rees impact, in particular when you look at this place right here, which is right on the rim of the crater, and you blow it up, what you find are two units. The lower one is called the Bunta Breccia. This is a lithic breccia. It looks just like Tisdale. It looks just like Kid Creek. This is stuff that was emplaced, ballistically transported pretty short distances on the rim of the crater. And then lying on top of that, variable in thickness, somewhat discontinuous, but covering most of it is a suavite breccia that looks very, very much like uh, the stuff that we, that we see at uh, uh, up and down most of the length of Cape York. This suavite breccia, by the way, is used quite a bit. It's quarried as uh, building stones in that portion of Germany. So if we ever decide to build buildings at Cape York, we know where to go for good building materials. Um, the elemental composition of the breccias up and down the length of Cape York is essentially identical. This is a complicated plot. But it's data for five different rocks that we've taken where they're alpha particle X-ray spectrometer. You can see the major elements here. And all we've done here is ratio the composition of the rocks on an element by element basis to the composition of those sandstones that we saw out on the, the plains for so long. And the point is, element by element, these things all look just about the same. Up and down the length of this thing, it's made of the same stuff. And the reason for this is that we're looking at ejecta from a single impact. This is all ejecta from the Endeavour impact itself. And so the suavites in particular are sort of an average composition of the target material, probably with some of the impact are mixed in, and that's what we see here, and all the rocks up and down the length of this are the same. Go to Husband Hill, though, and it's a totally different story. This is a very similar plot. Same sort of thing. In this case, what we've done is we've ratioed the composition to those basalts that we saw out on the plains at Gusev. But the point here is that there's a bunch of different rock types. And this is only the first five that we found as we were working our way up Husband Hill. As we worked our way down the other side, there were more. So we have found a bewildering diversity of geochemistry among the rocks of Husband Hill that I would argue are probably representative of the target materials of different impacts scattered here, there, and everywhere around Gusev Crater that found their way onto the flanks and were draped onto Husband Hill. I'm going to show you just a couple of the rock types that we see. The first is going to be the rocks of the western spur of Husband Hill as we worked our way up it. Um, here is a rock called Tettle. You can see this is a microscopic image or image. This is uh, three centimeters on a side. So you can see fine-grained sort of sub-centimeter scale layering within this rock. Uh, you see a mixture of grain sizes. This is a close-up view of another rock in the same vicinity, and you see some chunks that are up to millimeters in size. These are not pieces the size of your head. They're little tiny things, a few millimeters in size, all the way down to the to the, uh, the resolution li limit of the images. And so what you're seeing here is still a, a mixture of grain sizes that speaks of a fairly high energy emplacement, but these are much smaller grain sizes, so again, we're probably much farther from the impact itself. We're going to go now up onto the summit ridge of Husband Hill, a place that we named Cumberland Ridge. And now we see even finer grain rocks. Very, very fine grain, very fine grain layering. This is a rock called Methuselah. This view is a mosaic of microscopic, microscopic images. It's about 12 centimeters across. So, so now we're seeing very fine grained rock, uh, very fine layering. So again, probably stuff that was quite far. The actual impact that produced this was, was probably quite far away. 
Now, as we look at the chemistry and the mineralogy of these individual units, we see evidence for a couple things. One is multiple sources. Some of the rocks came from over here. Some of the rocks came from over there. They are different in their initial composition. But we also see clear evidence for alteration. That takes several forms. One is simply in the chemistry. This is a, a, a plot of uh, the chemistry of some of the rocks on the West Spur. And there are several elements, notably sulfur, chlorine, phosphorus, bromine, that are highly enhanced in these, suggesting that the, these are the kinds of things that tend to be mobilized uh, readily by liquid water. It's also pretty rich in nickel, which probably represents a contribution from the impactor that created this, uh, this, this ejected deposit in the first place. Um, when we look at the mineralogy of that rock, we see evidence, significance for evidence for alteration. There's some pyroxene, there's some olivine, but we also, the blue stuff, this is a Mossbauer spectrum, and those blue peaks, that is gertite. Gertite's an oxyhydroxide. You only form it in the presence of water. So this is evidence for aqueous alteration of these rocks. So the ejecta were in place, but sometime after they were in place, there was an alteration process that occurred. Now that alteration process was a little bit weird, and let me, let me show you what I mean by that. This is from over on uh, Cumberland Ridge, and it's a bunch of different rocks, and you can see they all have basically the same elemental composition. Yet if you look at these same rocks in an outcrop, this is, these are all measurements from a region that is maybe 10 meters, 20 meters in size. And so we're taking measurements that are five meters apart horizontally, in some cases maybe only 50 centimeters apart vertically. And yet there's enormous variability in the mineralogy of these rocks. The elemental chemistry is the same, but the minerals present are very, very different. This is data again from our Mossbauer spectrometer. Some of these rocks really very little alteration. You see a lot of olivine, you see a lot of pyroxene. Fe3 plus to Fe total is like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, something like that, so they're not heavily oxidized. But there are other places that literally might be a meter away. Same stuff in terms of the elemental chemistry, but heavily oxidized. Uh, Fe3 plus to Fe total of like 0 0.9, 0 0.95, so very oxidized. You see lots of hematite, you see lots of gertite. So water was, was clearly heavily involved, but the water could not have been abundant. Yes, water must have coursed through this stuff, changing the mineralogy, but it had to have taken place at a pretty low water to rock ratio. And it had to have been very localized. So don't, the reason I say low, low water to rock ratio is if a lot of water was going through this stuff, you would see changes in the chemistry. You don't. You only see changes in the mineralogy. The reason I say highly localized is you can find literally two outcrops a meter or two apart, one of which is highly altered and one of which is not. So think steam vents. Think uh, a little bit of heated vapor that has been heated probably by the energy of the impact itself, rises through this stuff, locally alters the rock. Hot, a little bit wet, but, but low water to rock ratio alteration. We see similar sort of stuff over at... Uh, um, over at uh, Endeavor. This is going back to the rock Tisdale. We looked at a bunch of these rocks. Uh, this is several different measurements of Tisdale and some of its brethren. And you see a composition that's actually a pretty close match uh, to some of the rocks that we see at Gooseb. But there's one really noteworthy difference. This really jumps out at you. There's a ton of zinc. There's an awful lot of zinc in this rock. Now, why would there be so much zinc? Well, on Earth, where you find enriched zinc deposits is typically around uh, the, the kinds of uh, massive sulfide deposits that are associated with hydrothermally altered rocks. Uh, and this is a picture of a, of a, a uh, it's actually in the Kid Creek Mine. Uh, this is actually in, uh, in uh, Ontario. And it makes the point that the, the feedstock for these mines typically has uh, zinc weight percent of maybe one to five percent or something like this, Tisdale has up to a half a percent of zinc. Now, I'm not claiming we have found economically viable zinc deposits on Mars, but that's a lot of zinc, okay? The interesting thing about this zinc, though, is that not only is it high, but it's very variable in its concentration. Even if we measure different spots on that rock Tisdale that are tens of centimeters apart, this is the highest number that we've seen. We've also seen numbers two or three times less than that. 
So this, this mineralization, this zinc deposition that has taken place here is highly localized. I would argue that it's probably, as it is on Earth, the result of hydrothermal activity. And in fact, if you look at how much heat is deposited simply by taking the kinetic, kinetic energy of an impactor capable of making a hole in the ground 22 kilometers in diameter on Mars, it is sufficient to set up hydrothermal systems in the rim deposits that can persist for hundreds to thousands of years. And so what I think we're probably seeing here is the consequence of that kind of hydrothermal activity. We also see evidence for other sorts of geologic violence uh, at uh, Gusev in particular in the form of explosive volcanism. Uh, this is home plate. Home plate is a plateau of layered rocks. They are basaltic in their composition. Um, they are a very, very good match to the composition of nearby pieces of highly vesicular basalt that we see, clearly extrusive volcanics. Um, and yet what we see in this stack of layered deposits here is evidence that they were in place in an explosive fashion. Uh, the best evidence for that is a bomb sag. This is a place, this is a, a class that's about four centimeters across, and you can see layers deformed beneath this. This thing fell out of the sky. Okay, so something went boom here. And in this particular instance, because it is such a good match to the composition of nearby uh, uh, vesicular basalts, we believe that this was a, a volcanic explosion, possibly a phreatomagmatic one where, where hot lava came into contact with water bearing rocks. Stuff, uh, water flashed into steam and it went boom. Now one of my favorite things about home plate is not home plate itself, but this adjacent valley here that we named uh, Silica Valley. Spirit had a tough time over its life. We worked it pretty hard going up and down a big mountain on Mars and about 800 days into the mission the right front wheel failed. And what that meant is that we had to then drive the vehicle by dragging that dead wheel through the soil. And a good day was like five meters. But the silver lining was that dead wheel dug this marvelous hundreds of meters long trench through the Martian soil and uh, every so often something marvelous would show up in the trench. This is uh, some deposits that were unearthed by the wheel as we were driving through Silica Valley. We observed this both with our infrared spectrometer mini tests and with our alpha particle x-ray spectrometer. Here's APXS data. This stuff is 91 percent pure silica, SiO2. It is not quartz. It is not beach sand. You can see by looking at the mini test data that this is amorphous hydrated silica. This is opal. Um, also, it contains a significant enrichment of titanium, which I'll return to in, uh, in just a moment. Now, as soon as we found this silica-rich soil, we started looking around at the rocks. We looked around with many tests. We found what looked like very silica-rich stuff. We went over and we looked at the rock, and, and indeed, uh, we found rock that was, that was very rich in silica as well. So it wasn't just the soil. It was also the rocks. Now, the question we had at this point was, and this is, this is many test data compared to uh, from, from Mars compared to infrared spectra of both silica-rich rocks and silica-coated rocks on Earth. And so the question we faced was, are we seeing just a silica coating on the outside of these rocks, or are they rich in silica through and through? Now, the tool on our rover that's designed to answer questions like that is the rack, the rock abrasion tool, which can grind away the outer surface of a rock, but we wore the rat out back up on Husband Hill. So we had to get a little creative. The approach that we took was to try to just crunch some of this stuff with the wheels. Okay, you know, blunt force trauma in the service of science. And we, we drove over a rock and we drove back and it didn't break, but a rock next to it did break. So we named that one Innocent Bystander. And uh, Innocent Bystander not only broke, but obligingly flipped itself over, exposing a nice fresh surface. And in fact, that was very, very rich in silica. So what's going on here? One possibility is that we're seeing a siliceous center that was formed in a hot spring environment where you have hot water with a neutral pH that goes below the surface. It interacts with rocks. It will pick up silica in solution. It's hot, so it's buoyant. It rises. As it rises, it cools. The silica comes out of solution, and you can precipitate out thick silica deposits. That could be what we are seeing here. Here's another possibility. I like this one too. 
This is some work that was done by Dick Morris uh, on our team, and he went to Hawaii. And here's a place where there was some basalt that was exposed to very caustic, very low pH vapors that were rising out of a volcanic fumarole. And you can see the, the rock that was alterated, altered by those fumarole gases. What Dick did was he took this rock and he sliced it up like a loaf of bread. Then he made centimeter by centimeter measurements of the elemental chemistry. Look at the stuff on the left-hand side. What happens is most of the chemical elements get leached away. It turns out that at very low pH, silica is a particularly insoluble species. And so what you get is very high silica concentrations. This has to be a coincidence, but in fact, the, the concentration at the very top is 91% silica. And the other element that goes way up is titanium. So we may be seeing here the interaction of basaltic rocks with volcanic gases, uh, volcanic fumaroles. We do at both landing sites also see minerals that were precipitated from water. Uh, this is an outcrop at the Spirit site called Comanche. When we look at it with our Mossbauer spectrometer in purple here, what we see is the clear signature of siderite. Siderite is an iron carbonate. When we look at it with Minitas, our infrared spectrometer, uh, we can model the composition of the stuff, and what we get is a mixture of iron and magnesium carb carbonate that makes up almost 35% of this rock. So these are massive carbonate deposits that are found in this one region to the, uh, to the south of Husband Hill that may speak of a time when the water had a different chemistry, not acidic. You're not going to make carbonates like this in an acid environment, but a more neutral pH. We also found evidence for aqueous precipitates uh, over, at, uh, over at Endeavor. Um, there was a rock that we found called Homestake. This was a wonderful surprise. When we first pulled up, to the edge of Endeavor Crater, what we found as we worked our way along the edge of Cape York is it looked like somebody had gone out there with a bucket of white paint and painted stripes on the ground. And we went and we looked at these close up, and they're veins. There's some kind of fracture-filling veins, very light-toned material. Uh, this is the one that we named Homestake. It's about as thick as your thumb. It's about as long as your forearm. Here it is as seen through our microscopic imager, sitting up above the terrain around it. When you measure the composition of this stuff, um, very high in calcium, very high in sulfur, as near as we can tell, of course, we have to worry about coatings and we have to worry about background. As near as we can tell, this stuff is pure calcium sulfate. We cannot distinguish this from anything other than pure calcium sulfate. We believe that it is most likely gypsum, uh, this is some very nice work that was done by Melissa Rice. Melissa has used the long wavelength filters of PanCam to uh, try to establish some spectral signatures that are indicative of hydration in minerals. And when she does that, what she finds is that this particular home stake feature lights up. It's very rich in what appears to be hydrated stuff. And when you crunch it with the wheels, it lights up even more. So we, we have a lot of fun breaking things with our rover. And uh, when you crunch this stuff with the wheels, it lights up even more, suggesting that it's rich in, in, uh, in water through and through. And when you compare the composition of different possible calcium sulfates, including anhydrite and so forth, you get the best, mix, uh, best match from gypsum. So we think these are probably gypsum veins. Gypsum veins, of course, are, are common uh, in various settings on Earth. They're precipitated from water that flows through the rocks. And so what we think here is that as fluids that rose out of this ancient Noachian terrain of Shoemaker Ridge, as they came up to the surface, they were saturated in, they, they contained various sulfate minerals and the least soluble, the first one that reaches saturation, the one that will first precipitate out is indeed calcium sulfate, is gypsum. So that's what we think that we're seeing here. Okay, I have one, thing, one more thing I want to talk about before I conclude. Everything that I've shown you so far, is, so far is stuff that we have published or presented at different meetings. This stuff is brand new. Um, and this stuff is work in progress. So what I've shown you so far is, is things that we've published elsewhere. This is me sitting down on a rock and cracking open my field notebook and showing you what we have so far at this wonderful place that we've called Matijevich Hill. One of the things that drew us to the rim of Endeavor, Endeavor Crater, and this is work that was done by James Ray, now at Georgia Tech, is the clear spectral signature of clay minerals 
in the rim of the crater, in portions of the crater rim. And so uh, we came here hoping to find clays. There was some very nice work uh, that's been done mostly by Ray Arvidson, who was on our team, also on the CRISM team that enabled this discovery. And Ray has been able to isolate six CRISM pixels. He talked about that earlier this week. Six CRISM pixels here on Cape York that actually show this clay mineral signature. We have arrived in those six pixels. It's a place that we named uh, Matijevich Hill, after Jake Matijevich, who was a, uh, an engineer who was instrumental in getting our rovers to Mars and who passed away recently. And we see a couple of, again, I'm cracking open my field notebook. I'm not going to claim I understand any of this stuff yet, but I'll show you what we got so far. Um, the dominant rock type of Matijevich Hill looks nothing like anything else we see anywhere else on Cape York. As soon as we passed into raised six pixels, everything's different. Okay, and what we see is this rock type here. It's a rock that we've named uh, Whitewater Lake. It is light-toned. It is very fine-grained. It is very, very soft. You can just chew into this stuff with the rock abrasion tool. Uh, this clearly must be the unit that, that carries the clays. It is the, it is the thing that just uniquely correlates with the clay signature that we see from orbit. It has an elemental composition that kind of looks like average Mars. There's nothing extraordinary about the elemental composition of this stuff, but this has to be the clay-bearing species, and there's a lot of it in this particular location. Uh, this shows what we first saw when we pulled up this Whitewater Lake, as you can see, this unit in the background, but then there are also these high-standing, more erosionally resistant, kind of lumpy looking things. Okay, this is a rock that we named Kirkwood. We looked at Kirkwood with our, <laughs> with our microscopic imager and we saw this. And the first thing I thought when I saw this picture was, oh, blueberry pie. Okay, this thing has to be shot through with these hematite blueberries. Well, that's interesting. Well, it turns out these are not made of hematite. These are not blueberries. There's something new. I've been calling them newberries because I can't think of anything else to call them. <laughs> Um, they are not rich in iron, they are not rich in hematite, they may have some compositional, a weak compositional contrast uh, with the stuff around them, but we've not been able to characterize it yet. Again, we just got here. Mars is at this location presenting us with a wonderful new geologic problem to solve. It's, a, it's as if after nine years of exploring, Mars is now giving us our final exam. And this is a tough one. It's a, it's a subtle problem. It's an interesting problem. We can work all of this out. What we've been doing recently is doing, a, we did what we call our walkabout. We sort of walked the outcrop. We just recently concluded a loop around Matijevich Hill to see where all the good stuff is. And for the months to come, we will be exploring this region, trying to unravel the history of this place and how the clay is formed. Uh, this is a picture that just came down a few days ago. Uh, this shows, again, some of this... Whitewater Lake unit. Another thing that's interesting is there are some lovely narrow veins that are running through the stuff. Don't know what these are made of. We're going to find out. If I had to bet money, I'd bet gypsum, but we'll see. And then this is the road ahead. Everything that I've shown you, all the spectacular stuff, is on this little kind of unspectacular lump of the rim of Endeavor Crater. We still have this and this, Cape Tribulation, taller than Husband Hill, out ahead of us. I don't know if we're going to get there. But we're going to drive these things till the wheels fall off. And if we can, we shall. I want to conclude with this. Um, interest in Mars, as we have seen by the deep interest in the Curiosity mission, uh, the announcement yesterday by the Associate Administrator for Space Science that we're going to be sending another rover to Mars in 2020, has captured the public imagination. You can actually trace the public's fascination with Mars in a serious scientific way. I'm not talking about little green men, War of the Worlds, canals. I'm talking about in a serious scientific way. Back to an extraordinary series of articles that were published in Collier's Magazine back in the 50s. 53 and 54, this was the last one in the series. Uh, you can see, is there life on Mars? This was the question. This, whole, this series had to do with sending humans out into space and with motivating not just Mars exploration, but the entire space program. The motivation came from trying to answer the question, is there life on Mars? I would broaden that a little bit to was there ever life on Mars? The, the, the ultimate article, the best article in this whole series is this one here with the title that you see that was written 
by Fred Whipple. Fred was an extraordinary scientist. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very proud to uh, <laughs> have him be part of my lineage. And I think we're starting to get close to maybe answering this crucially important question that he posed. Thank you very much. We can take a few questions for Steve, if uh, folks have them. We'll get the lights up here. Way, 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 way in the back. Oh, is there somebody in the back? I'm sorry. Please so, shout it out. I didn't hear that. You're going to have to read really loud. Oh, have we flow of Lapilli? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned we've got uh, four or five different working hypotheses for what they might, the, the, the new berries might be. They could be concretions, but if they are, they're not glued together with hematite. They could be accretionary lapilli. Uh, they could be impact spherules, which are sort of the impact uh, version of accretionary lapilli. They could be devitrification de spherules. We've got a bunch of hypotheses on the table. Um, you can come up with a set of specific predictable observations that you can make uh, to differentiate among these hypotheses. We have the tools to make those observations, and right now we're just trying to keep an open mind and let the rocks do the talking. But yeah, that's definitely one of the possibilities. Okay. All right, well, don't go anywhere. Uh, let's, uh, let me uh, give Steve again this highly exotic um, certificate. Uh, for his uh, his Whipple Award and for the presentation he gave, and uh, and let's uh, let's thank him again. I'd like to ask Steve and Alex and and Cindy to stick around so we can take a couple of pictures. I'll also just close by saying I pretty sure this is my last official duty as president of the section. Uh, in January, we'll be handing over the reins to Bill McKinnon, uh, who will take over as the section president, and Lindy elkins Tanton will take over as the, uh, the president-elect, and they're going to do a great job. You're left in fabulous hands here. So I want to thank everybody for their participation, especially this past year, as, uh, as we've been a little bit of an activist session, or section, excuse me. And, uh, and thank everybody for their continued support and involvement with AGU. Have a good day, everyone.